Hey, Marcus, how are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, really looking forward for the conversation with you today. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for uh, our Simple Talk series. Since this is the first episode of the series, I would like to take a few seconds to briefly tell our audience about it. So the series is about holding meaningful yet candid conversations with leaders revolving around the subjects such as leadership, organization culture, technology, and design. So today we will be talking about how organizations can build empowered engineering teams in a remote first environment. But before we start our conversation, Marcus, can you quickly introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Marcus. I am based in Switzerland. Uh, I'm with the company for almost 11 years. Uh, initially, I've been working for the largest business of Sempress uh, called Vistaprint. Um, as a software engineer in manufacturing. So I've been focusing on automating production processes and machinery on the shop floor. And for the past six years, I've been part of Simpress Technology, building the mass customization platform, connecting those businesses. Um, and initially I helped shaping the early versions of the order flow uh, and most recently the data platform. And actually my next adventure is also coming up by joining another business, uh, Wir machen Druck in Germany. And uh, yes, doing this in an all remote uh, position, uh, which was you know, potentially previously not necessarily possible. Great, that sounds exciting. So let's begin the conversation. Now that we have completed one year of going and working fully remote, why don't we start with your journey of working remotely? What has it been like? I mean, ups and downs as probably many of you listening uh, to this can relate. Um, so. Let's start with work. From a pure work perspective, almost nothing has changed. Uh, the simplest data platform of roughly 40 people had only three people in Switzerland. The other were distributed among five uh, different locations in India, uh, some European countries and the US. So distributed working was part of our day-to-day -day life already. Um, but we had obviously social interactions with local peers, um, and we were able to travel, uh, which made a big change. We were able to travel for creating social bonds and do especially the creative work around planning, around whiteboarding, brainstorming, and potentially some projects that were across teams and a little bit harder to take off in an all remote position, especially if, if many of them are you know, very office focused and potentially even co-located. Um, and well, there's the personal side, right? I have two little children. I'm currently in a smallish apartment um, and it comes with a lot of advantages. I spend more time with family. Um, there is no, you know, no travel. It means more time at home um, and we are two working parents. So we can juggle a lot more today, uh, how, it, you know, how it works, you know, spreading obviously into the evening is only a disadvantage of that, but also enjoying some of the daytime with, with the little kids. Um, Summer has been fairly easy, a lot of outdoors. Um, uh, winter, the last three months uh, of the European winter were really tough. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hopefully, you know, the summer vaccines and everything, making this an enjoyable uh, way of working remotely, working from home uh, versus really, uh, you know, it's, it's remote forced for many and let's recognize that. So, you know, probably many of the things might resonate with you, but you know, Focusing on work, uh, not a lot has changed, and I rather see a lot more opportunities than drawbacks. Yeah, I think the future is going to be very exciting with the whenever the vaccines are out and the situations are back to normal, the new normal. <laughs> okay, so now that Simpress has become remote first, and chances are that many organizations are likely to follow fully remote or hybrid model of work, how do you think organizations can get better new team members onboarded smoothly? Well, not, not a lot has changed on the outcome. So you want to integrate a person into the team and make this an effective contributor and also ensure that this person creates some sense of belonging. Um, but that said, everything has changed and how we need to act on that. So in an office environment, just think back a Think back quite a while, right? Uh, people walked around the office on your first day, handshakes with everyone and smiles and team lunch on the first day. Uh, then someone from IT setting, sitting next to you, hand-holding you from creating the accounts and all those type of things. And well, today you want, you want similar things. You want to create this great first impression for new joiners. Um, 
and at the same time also some smooth technical onboarding. Um, so, you know, what comes to mind are something like a really, really nice welcome package. Um, and in addition, all the equipment, you need to actually do your work. Um, a lot of the things on the technology side will need to move towards a lot more self-service than they were in the past. And self-service, not only for software engineers like me who can go fairly deep into technology, but from people from other departments who have other strengths. Um, and uh, it also needs to work for them. And, uh, and just to relate a little bit where Simpress is on that journey is, um, well, first we learned a lot from other companies. We were also distributed and, you know, technology uh, like IT support and HR was already distributed before. So we did a little bit of that before, but obviously way not what we could have done. Um, so we are, we are a little bit further than many other companies. At the same time, we are still learning from what the industry is doing um, and then adjusting that what, what we believe fits into our very own niche. So definitely Liam, what comes to mind, like have a really, really nice welcome package with like a t-shirt like mine with some technology on it or whatever business you are joining. Um, you know, and whether that's a t-shirt or something else, doesn't really matter, but like just creating a first impression there. And then, you know, from an IT side, we had started the journey of self-servicing almost everything three, four years ago. And the last year just accelerated a lot more around that. And I think there is nothing is in our way at the same time, like, you know, shipping IT equipment across the world on time, often to like, oh, this person starts in two weeks type of situations is, is a challenge to, to obviously uh, get through the next few uh, months as we iterate on the process. So while we settle down to this uh, new situation and figure out the way forward, what role do you think uh, organization culture plays here? Like what kind of culture should organizations adopt while they are setting up new distributed teams, especially across the borders and in a remote forced environment? So um, there, there are a lot of aspects. Um, you know, some are very foundational. Uh, for example, you want to create the right legal foundations of contracting people in as many countries as, well, possible or needed by your by your company. Um, so instead of going into many of those aspects, let's just focus on one thing which I believe is key to collaboration culture, which is creating an asynchronous collaboration model. Um, this leads to many, many good outcomes for, especially for the people personally, but also for um, increased value and, and effectiveness of teams collaborating uh, between each other in the organization. Um, so that means, Async collaboration is actually you're able to contribute to a project no matter where you're located and when you do that. Given that we have roughly 10 and a half hours difference between our teams in India and teams in the US, and we have production sites in Japan, in Australia, in Europe, in the US, in India, it's just like an amazing opportunity to accelerate on what we have started. Uh, that means more or less you need to move towards a documentation and a writing culture. Um, and not just like, hey, here's the last 100,000 meeting notes, but rather like, what's the always current status? What's the current architecture? What's the current best documentation for this product? You know, that means deleting old things, iterating on old things, like really treating your documentation like a product, like something that you own. Um, software engineers are used to do that for their user interfaces, for their services, constantly iterating, and documentation is now an integrated part of that. And not only for software engineers, really collaborating um, with other teams from marketing, from sales to manufacturing, and so on. Um, and once you establish that, um, and, and just I give you one very tiny example from, from our team is we don't, we really try, try to drive down meetings and the outcome is actually, I'm in way less meetings today than I'm in a year, for, uh, a year ago, uh, especially that we accelerated a lot of those aspects. And like every meeting now has a document to pre-read. And the document could be three bullet points to start with. Everyone contributes. And all of a sudden we have a one or two pager collaborated by the meeting participants, which might be five people, which might be 10 people, which might be just two people. Um, and then there might be a meeting or not. Very often we figure out on the way it's, oh, everyone agrees. Can we just write this down? Everyone agrees on, we need to do this as the next step. We save the meeting. Um, 
sometimes there are certain nuances that are worthwhile to be discussed in person. There are, um, you know, discussions about a final decision still worth doing, especially if the stakes are high and so on. So those still happen. Um, and, and those are, those are also like your meetings give, give it a little bit of a different purpose. It's really, I go to a meeting, I'm fully concentrated. Um, if you're done after 20 minutes, great, beer off. If you're done after an hour, that's also perfectly fine. It's not necessarily like, you know, meetings back to back all day long. Uh, that is really my past and not my, my current uh, situation anymore. Um, so another key aspect of reducing those meetings and replacing this with written uh, and collaboratively created documents. And I think that is really the key of, of the culture. It's, it's creating more inclusivity. For those who are working in time zones far apart, all of a sudden, uh, a team member in, let's say in India is able to contribute equally to a, a, um, a document or topic that has mostly team members in the US, which is nine and a half or 10 and a half hours away. And you can do that during your normal office hours or work hours and not need to stretch and join a meeting at 10 p.m. your time. Um, so that is, you know, very, very specific one. At the same time, it's also just imagine some of your meetings. Typically, it's one loud voice talking, one loud voice making those decisions. Um, and, you know, there's sometimes good reasons for that. This is really the thought leader. This is um, uh, the person with the most experience. At the same time, you're eliminating voices from all those who need a second thought, who need three hours to think it through, who might want to look up, and then their thoughts are three times as much more valuable. So you're not losing out on those great ideas on certain simplifications, what can be done and so on. So uh, this is especially, it's, it will be a big change and a big opportunity for those who had naturally being more quiet, more thoughtful, um, all of a sudden they will shine uh, in such an environment. And this is a, I think this is a culture that we all wanna strive forward. Um, and you know, it's one aspect of inclusivity, uh, but I think a, a really important one that uh, that is also centered around this sense of belonging uh, and so on that the people feel part of the team, no matter where they are working from, when they are working, um, how they want to do their day, uh, how, how they want to plan their work day and personal life day in, in a smooth transition that works for them. I think this was quite exhaustive and uh, insightful. I think it will help many organizations which are still paving their way for the new future or the new work model. Okay, so I think Marcus, the biggest challenge that organizations are facing uh, under this new work setup is how to measure the success of their team members. So according to you, uh, how do you think organizations can combat that challenge while they are wo either working remotely or in a hybrid work model? So I think they, have, they should have combated that 20 years ago. Um, so what should be measured is the outcome, the effectiveness, the value created of every team member and therefore of every, you know, smallish team where it is the influence of that uh, team member. And that has not changed, um, at least not as you think of creative work, marketing, software engineering, and so on. It's obviously a little bit different and that's what I'm explicitly not talking when you're working in manufacturing and let's say you can pack one package per minute. Yes, every minute longer you are there, the more efficient you are. But in creative work, you're not talking about efficiency. It's talking about effectiveness of what the value you're creating, what's the outcome for the business, uh, and so on. So anyway, so now going to, to measuring is there, they're just like, let's recognize there's still many people working and just being control jobs. Um, they're controlling whether you worked your 40 hours. And if you did that, um, then uh, yes, you checked all the marks, right? And, and there was also some social pressure if you showed up late in the office. And there was even more social pressure when I actually left the office early. And that has now really gone and instead of those who are looking at that might still be puzzled, um, but really get over that. Think of how can you show your value being created? And you know, if you're a lead, leader, people manager, team lead, uh, even a director or VP of some organization, um, you know, get away from quantitative measures like software engineering world. You have lines of codes, ticket run through the 
uh, tickets completed the last week, uh, support calls handled, you name it. All those quanti quantitative measures will be gamed, especially if they are at the center of a team's, of a person's evaluation. Um, instead, look at the outcomes. Like, are the customers happier? Does the team produce less bugs? Does the product have adoption? Is the software more stable? Um, and is the team being able to pivot quickly to ever-changing requirements of the users? Um, some of them are a little bit harder to measure and is more a feeling, but typically you could potentially look at how many escalations does team A have versus team B. Um, others are a little bit easier to measure, like you know, how many support calls do we have and then categorize that. And if you're down to a, uh, to a limit where you can count them on your hand, and you're probably good. If you need a system to do that, then probably there's work to do. It can be as simple as that to, towards two more sophisticated things. Um, so in short, people with the right attitude towards customers, internal or external leadership, results orientation, or simply products, creating a long-term sustainable product will succeed over the long term. Okay, so lastly, I would just quickly end the conversation by just one more question. So do you think we will need a shift in mindset to adopt to this new model of working? Maybe something like having a stronger product mindset with long-term thinking. Do you think that would help? Absolutely. Um, so it's a little bit following up on the hints I, I gave you before. And, um, and, you know, think of if you're not measured by the lines of codes today, uh, but by the decreased amount of support calls or bug reports in three months from now, um, what difference? What what uh, is uh, what differences are you making in your decisions? Um, so those who succeed, those who will succeed, will have a track record of making sustainable long-term product decisions. So setting the customer at the center, and at the same time, also being able to incrementally deliver results every single day. So as a team lead, really, really ensure that you set the incentives right. So who do you recognize? The one who fixed the bug at midnight or the one who constantly prevents bugs? So just think about that. And I'm sure you'll find many, many occasions of the first and less of the latter, no matter where you stand and even if you try hard of the latter. Um, that said, make the latter the default of you know, incentivizing, recognizing those who do the good, make good long-term decisions and ingrain that in your team's culture and this team will be very successful over time. Not today, not tomorrow, but the right people will recognize this. And I'm sure they will also recognize your actions and your contribution you have made to change the team's culture. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Marcus. I think this was a great conversation and it will help many people out there as well. So thank you again for taking out time for this conversation. And I would like to thank our audience as well for watching this. You'll soon be back with another interesting topic. Thanks again, Marcus. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Bye.